Uh, my name is Owen Wurzbacher, and I'm an MBA too, and I'm a student leader for the Corporations and Society Initiative here at the GSB. Uh, CASI brings together experts to provide business students and policymakers with a more comprehensive perspective on the role of corporations and capitalism in our society. Through research, advocacy, and education, we are rethinking some of the premises and assumptions about the role of private and public institutions in our society. One of the most fundamental assumptions in business education is the principle, famously articulated by Milton Friedman, that the purpose of a corporation is maximizing financial value for its shareholders. In his annual letter to CEOs last year, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink challenged this assumption, arguing that companies should serve a social purpose and benefit all their stakeholders, including shareholders, employees, customers, and the communities in which they operate. Mr. Fink is not alone. Investors, academics, politicians, and activists are all re-examining the appropriate role for shareholders in engaging management, pushing companies to think long-term, and advocating for a broader conception of corporate purpose. The issue is not going to go away soon. In this year's letter, Mr. Fink cited a recent survey which found that the vast majority of millennials believe that the primary purpose of business should be improving society rather than generating profit. We are fortunate to have a guest with us today who is among the best qualified people in the world to discuss the nature of shareholder ownership and its implications for our society. Barbara Novick is the vice chairman, co-founder, and a member of the Global Executive Committee of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager with approximately $6.3 trillion in AUM. In her role, Ms. Novick oversees the firm's investment stewardship and public policy efforts. Prior to BlackRock's founding, Ms. Novick began her Wall Street career with the investment banks Morgan Stanley and the first Boston Corporation. Interviewing Barbara today is not Rana Furuhar, a business columnist and associate editor at the Financial Times. Rana had a family emergency and can't be with us today. In Rana's place, however, is Paul Fleiderer, the Miller Distinguished Professor of Finance at the GSB. Professor Fleiderer served as Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs from 2013 to 2018 and has taught at the GSB since 1981. Following their conversation, we will continue by taking questions from you, our audience. Now, please join me in thanking again and welcoming our guests. So I'm going to start off this interview um, by trying to say something insulting, which is I'm sitting next to a big gorilla. Uh, as you uh, just heard, and I'm sure everybody knows, uh, BlackRock has over six trillion under management, which is a huge number. Just to put that in perspective, there are only two countries in the world that have a GDP greater than that. And I'm sad to say that it's even greater than the California GDP, which I just looked up is 2.7 trillion. So uh, in any event, that obviously is important for what we're talking about because BlackRock is in a position, because it's, again, a big grill. I hope you don't take offense with that, uh, to, to make change. And uh, I just want to read, uh, before we get started, something else from uh, Larry Fink's most recent letter. Uh, society, he writes, is increasingly looking to companies, both public and private, to address pressing social and economic issues. These issues range from protecting the environment to retirement to gender and racial inequality, among others. So the series of questions that I'm going to ask here are going to be focused primarily on what can BlackRock do what is it willing to do, and how does it plan to do that? But I want to go back to Milton Friedman, which Owen uh, mentioned uh, in his introduction. Originally, when Milton Friedman wrote uh, his article back in 1970, he talked about maximizing profits, that the management of a company owed the owners of the company the duty of ma maximizing profits. All the years that I've taught finance, we've sort of translated that into maximizing shareholder wealth as measured by the price of the stock today. If you're a manager and you do something for the shareholders, the price is going to go up. Otherwise, it'll go down. And uh, so that's a bit of a reframing of Milton Friedman. 
But I want to ask, uh, in the course of these questions, if we're reframing Milton Friedman yet again by saying that we're going to maximize long-run value. And in various letters, uh, he mentions long-term uh, 37 times in those, those, those two letters. So I want to start by some hypotheticals. And uh, I get to respond to the Milton Friedman comments? Oh, of course. Yeah, no, no, you can, yeah, yeah, exactly. Since uh, you're on a roll, you're all on a roll about Milton Friedman. Well, no, no, no please, with please. That. Okay, so, you know, clearly we've, we've heard that question, um, and, uh, you know, Fink versus Friedman, which one's right? And I don't think it's a right or wrong, and I think I'm going to start with a historical perspective, and then I'm going to, you know, drill into really the difference between the two and the nuances. So the historical perspective is, if you go back even further than Friedman, um, Johnson and Johnson, 1943, General Johnson writes the credo. And what is the credo for Johnson and Johnson? It says we need to consider employees, clients or customers, and communities we live in, as well as shareholders. So it's not that it's such a new concept and boy, it's like this lefty thing and it comes out of the blue, but it's actually, I would say, good business common sense. So I'll give the, the other historical perspective. What went wrong with WorldCom and Enron, BP, you know, recently Wells Fargo? I mean, are all of these things not very closely connected of people trying to, in some way, maximize that short-term profit, right, and especially Wells Fargo, right, that they're going to make a quick buck. It's going to be great for the stock price, maybe even great for their own compensation, but is that good for long-term value? Well, clearly not. In every one of those cases, you would not be, have ha be happy to have been a shareholder. So when you look at what Larry says, and he does put it in that context of long-termism, like what are we asking people to do? Is it unreasonable? You're all going to be looking for jobs, I assume, if you're second-year students. Um, you know, do you want to work at a company that treats its employees well, or do you want to be in a bucket shop? You know, do you want to be someplace where you get flexible benefits, where you can wear blue jeans to work? I mean, what things, and everybody's definition of benefits are different, but as a company, you know, the company has to be thinking, how do I attract and how do I retain people to work here? Whether it's at a low level, an assembly line, or it's at a high level. And in the United States today, you can't help but notice we're in a war for talent. And human capital management should be a really high issue on management's agenda, on the board's agenda. So is that Friedman or is that Fink? Customers. I'm proud to say we've been in business 31 years. Started our institutional business a few years into it. We have clients today who have been clients of BlackRock for 25 years. Now, why is that good? One, it's a real vote of confidence. We also have clients who have left their jobs and multiple times hired us as they've gotten to new jobs. Again, tremendous vote of confidence. But from a shareholder value perspective and from a, a economics of the firm, the, the saying, your best new customer is your existing customer, is absolutely true. The cost to acquire new business, to you know, onboard new clients, that is extraordinarily expensive. So if you don't retain the ones you have, you're affecting the long-term value. Now again, could you do something that maybe juices your returns early on and sell people things that they wake up later and realize they don't really want? I guess you could, but then do you have that customer for 25 years? So you know, rather than looking at these as Friedman versus Fink, I would say these are fundamental business issues we could throw the communities one on there. Clearly, if you are not operating in a good way, I mean, look at this dam that just broke. I mean, what's going to happen to some of these mining companies? And are they going to even have a license to be in business in those places? So it, in looking at the multiple stakeholders, I think people have to put a little bit different lens on it that this is good business judgment. And this is about, will you be in business in five years, in 10 years? Will I? end up better off holding you as a long-term investor. Because keep in mind, you talked about the $6 trillion. Let me break down that $6 trillion a little. 
only half of it, only half of it is equities. Right. right. Only three trillion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then of that, 90% is in index strategies, George, index strategies, and 10% is active. Now, again, 10% of three trillion is still a big number, but 90% is, is index. Well, if it's in the index, we don't like what the company is doing, we don't like the business they're in, we don't like the management team, we don't like something, we can't sell it. So if we're going to be long-term providers of capital, we have to have some other way of influencing or expressing our views. So in fact, uh, what you're saying is that oftentimes long-term value is completely aligned with what Milton Friedman is saying in the sense that there are a lot of things that can be done that enhance long-term value and ultimately uh, redound to the benefits of the shareholders in their portfolio holdings. So uh, an, an easy case is one where there's something that a company can do that will both produce long-term portfolio value, I'll call it, and also potentially value outside of the portfolio. The world will be a better place, healthcare will be better, so on and so forth. What I'd like to explore is situations where there's a potential trade-off. So we can define uh, a retiree cashing in on a portfolio, and there's the amount that is there in the account, and then there is outside of the portfolio return, which is hard to quantify, but it's what kind of world do we live in, what's the state of the environment, and so on and so forth. So it's easy when an action can be taken that increases both of those. How do we think about cases, or do we think about these at all, uh, from a fiduciary standpoint, where perhaps an action can be taken that might reduce the portfolio value by a little bit, but would have huge benefits to the clients on what we would call the outside portfolio returns. Milton Friedman, I think, would then say, no, that's not right. Uh, but I don't think if we are talking about the win-win situation, there's any distinction between what Larry Fink is saying and what Milton Friedman would say. So what okay. about the case where there's so, a trade-off? So two different things. One is at an individual company level, and I think that is up to the management of that company to say, you know, I think it's worth you know, spending money. And for example, we just announced a financial literacy program. We're going to spend money on something that clearly has nothing to do with our immediate business, but we think that as a philanthropic initiative, it's an important one for society at large. It's something we think uh, you know, is good for us to do. It's something we're, we're associated with. It has some hard to quantify, but let's say brand effects. Okay? That's at the company level, and that's an individual company decision of what is best for my company. I think what you're asking is more at the portfolio level. Okay, so I'm going to step back again. About 20 years ago, we started seeing people talk about socially responsible investing. Socially responsible investing was things like, you know, I'm a, a medical company. Um, and I don't want to have, or I'm a hospital, I don't want to have cigarettes in my portfolio. Now, I joke today and I say, would that same company, when cannabis becomes legal, would they say, I don't want cannabis in my portfolio? You can think about that one and talk about that after. Um, <laughs> I see some, some smiles. I mean, it's a good question, right? Where do you draw the line? Or you might have a religious order that says, um, you know, I don't want anything to do with defense or, you know, pick some other category. That's all fine. That is socially responsible investing. It is driven by the client. It is a choice they're making about their values. I want a portfolio that lines up with my values, and I'm willing to take the tracking error, perhaps under performance, maybe over performance, but certainly tracking error to the broader market to get what I want from a value perspective or values perspective. That is very different than what we talk about today. So today we use the phrase sustainable investing. What we're looking for in building a portfolio is, do we have a portfolio if it's, let's say, an active portfolio? Can we build a portfolio where we're thinking about these, and I like to call them GENS because I think governance comes first. We're thinking about these GENS factors 
and we're thinking about them from a portfolio maximization standpoint. And so it's not a conflict. It's not a, I need to give up some return to do good, which is sustain, the, the original um, socially responsible. The sustainable says, you know what, I think I'm going to win long term with a more sustainable portfolio. And you know the data is hard because it's not complete and it's not long enough and you know, there's all sorts of flaws. But as people are doing more research, the data is starting to become much more compelling. Uh, we did a paper recently on emerging market debt. It's very clear. You can build a portfolio that has as high and maybe even higher yield and has better ESG characteristics. You can, in equities also, we, we worked with MSCI to create a new series of ESG indices. And that series has very tight tracking error to the quote unquote mother index. And what's different is we're weighting companies that have better ESG characteristics. We're not eliminating sectors, okay? Very different than saying, let's take this whole industry out. But we're saying within an industry, we want the best ones. Why? Because we think that's operational excellence, right? So if we change the wording of how people talk about it, you wouldn't even think of it as, quote, ESG. You'd say, this is good value. This is good long-term thinking. This is a way to maximize the value of the portfolio. And I would say as a stewardship team, you know, because of that 90-10, in active portfolios, portfolio managers can pick this one or that one. We have indices which are optimized for ESG. If clients pick those indices, that's great. In some portfolios, it's just a plain portfolio, and you know the clients haven't expressed any interest in anything special. But we can still go to those companies and talk about these long-term issues and try and move them to be better on those. So there's different ways of, of sort of implementing sustainable investing depending on what the mandate is. So that's a very good segue to my next question, which is uh, how you potentially can affect change. And uh, the thing that people originally think of or quickly think of is, of course, proxy voting. Uh, but uh, I understand that you're much more, uh, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but uh, you're, you're much uh, more inclined potentially to engage behind the scenes. And uh, you've gotten some criticism. Uh, for example, I just wrote this down from an article saying that you only voted in favor uh, of uh, three of 40 resolutions on climate change, two of nine resolutions on public health, uh, two of 24 resolutions on worker rights and, and, and welfare. So perhaps uh, take a moment to tell us, first of all, how you think about proxy voting, but maybe if you can, tell us some individual cases, uh, maybe without getting into details, of where you've had effect on, on, on company policy that produces good that maybe we're not aware of. OK. So first thing is I want to talk a little bit about what investment stewardship is and isn't. Um, and then I want to talk about some of the numbers, because um, I call this our Goldilocks problem. Do we do too much? Do we too do little? I like to say the porridge is just right. And it is the Goldilocks situation. I was at a dinner last night. I was a speaker. and. You know, one person got up and asked me a question about, you know, why are we taking political positions on, on certain topics and voting so much? And you now quoted from an article that says, you know, why aren't you voting more? So for starters, voting is the end of the process, right? The process starts with what we call engagement first. We would much rather engage with management, engage with directors, tell them what concerns we have, and let them think about those and on their own, if they agree, move in certain directions. We're patient. We're going to be here a long time. The index money is not going away. So if we can do this in a way that the company internalizes it rather than beat them over the head, um, we actually think you end up with better results and better long-term results especially. So that's the first thing. The voting itself, to me, if we are voting against management, it's a little bit of a failure of engagement, right? So if we ended up with a year where we had zero votes against management, is that a success or a failure? Well, if we had gotten some results through engagement 
and we had moved people in the direction we thought was the right direction to go, then that's a screaming success. But people can see the voting numbers, see them, analyze them, quantify them, and they come up with all sorts of theories. So to put some numbers in perspective, you'll find some people will say the large managers just follow ISS. You'll see other people say, you know, these managers aren't voting enough. You'll get every different cut because everyone can take the data and see what they want in it. And it's very simple. If you take the Russell 3000, we did the study for the, the proxy year ending 2018. If you take the data, there are 28,000 ballot items. Of those, 98% are management proposals. Well, management proposals are, here's my slate of directors. Please reappoint the auditors. Maybe there's a say on pay in there. So let's say almost all of the 98% is not controversial. There's a little piece that's controversial. You might have a director who there's a problem. I mean, there are issues in there, but 95% support on 98% of the proposals. So you can see mathematically how we look like we follow ISS. In fact, every investor looks like they follow each other mathematically. So you can make a story out of that, and people have. On the other end of the spectrum, you take the 2% out, and that we did this study, and it's all on our website, did a study of five large managers. And what we found is the range of support for shareholder proposals went something like this. ISS, as a proxy advisor, recommended in favor of 70% of shareholder proposals. And shareholder proposals, these are the controversial ones. You know, disclose your political activity spending or something on climate or something on supply chain. I mean, this is where, where the controversies come in. And then when you looked at the managers, at the high end, they were about 30%. And at the low end, they were in the teens. So now you have people on one side saying, you're following ISS and you're, you're, you're doing something terrible to corporate America because you're always voting with, with ISS. OK. And you have other people saying, hey, wait a second. You have all these shareholder proposals, and you're in the teens when ISS is at 70%. Now, if you actually read the proposals that, that they're criticizing, you'd see some of them are like outrageous. Like you would never want a company to be forced to do some of the things. You know, it's, it's micromanaging the company at a level that is just not appropriate. And, and in fact, the SEC even excludes some, right? They give the, the company the, the right to not put it on the ballot. So, you know, I think the devil is in the details on a lot of this stuff. And you see tremendous amount of media coverage um, I don't know why, maybe it's fashionable, but everybody taking the numbers and cutting them the way they want to tell the story they want. And, you know, it's a somewhat dangerous thing. I have, I have three kids, and they're all similar age to this group. And, you know, over the dinner table over the years, you know, we would have uh, civics lessons, and I'd bring home a newspaper article, and I'd say, hey, let's talk about this newspaper article. It's a weird house, I know. And, <laughs> you know, it, it would be something that I knew was, like, absolutely outrageous. And my point was I wanted to teach them critical thinking. They'd read it, and we'd talk about it. I'd say, now, if I told you this statistic was taken out of context, and here's what it really is, now what do you think of the article? And they'd be horrified. And I said, well, that's how I want you to grow up. I want you to be adults. I want you to look at these things and not just take them at face value. Because even I was a little bit duped by the follow ISS at first. And I was racking my head. I got 40 people. Maybe we should fire them all. Like, what do I need to pay if we're just going to follow ISS? I said, that, that can't be. I know we're not voting that way. And it took a while till I figured out this 98-2 and then you saw the numbers and you just said, oh, OK, this is just silly. But that's, you need to really look at these things much more critically because people are taking that data. And it's, it's absolutely amazing the number of stories that are coming out and each one taking opposite perspectives. So let me take us in a slightly different direction. Uh, obviously, you're in a position potentially to influence uh, through voting or engagement. Uh, corporate actions. Uh, but there's another concern that has been uh, 
much on people's minds over the last decade or so, or probably longer than that, and that is the fact that in here in the United States and certainly other places as well, corporations lobby uh, for their own particular interests, potentially against not only the interest of the public, but the investing public. And uh, there's been concerns raised about auditing breaking down. We had concerns about rating agencies uh, being conflicted. Uh, I still bank, I'm afraid to say, at uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, because I just am too lazy to change my account. Uh, but uh, things have not always been hunky-dory there. That's a technical term we use in finance. So um, how, do you, how do you think about the, st uh, and uh, feel free to say whatever you can on this, uh, lobbying uh, BlackRock on regulations, on policy, PCLB, what have you, uh, to basically protect the investing public and, and, and the wider public, given that you hold a very wide portfolio and your clients are a broad public uh, mm -hmm. that are interested in uh, overall investment returns and, 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 and other things as well. So about 10 years ago, uh, we started the public policy group. Uh, so I'm a founder of BlackRock. The first 20 years I spent building the business, so working with clients, marketing, business development, client service, all those wrapped together. Um, the 10-year mark, we're sitting at 2009, wake of the financial crisis, and we say, something's going to change. But what? And we realize up until then, we have never had a public policy effort. We had zero resources. We had only once lobbied and issued, and we hired some firm in Washington. and. You know, they dragged our president at the time around to a few meetings. The issue sort of died a natural death, and that was the end of it. We had never had any involvement in political issues or policy issues for anything. And our working assumption was, oh, if there's a policy issue, somehow the street will take care of it. Like, that's not really our job. They just do that. And keep in mind, we were also, we started with we a small company. We had nothing. We had a blank piece of paper. And... Yeah, we grew from that, so we were very focused on starting our business. But here we are at the 20-year mark. We're a much bigger business, not quite as big as we are today. Uh, we did a big acquisition along the way. Um, but we're, we're substantial, and we're saying, wait a second. The street was a source of a lot of the problems. We don't know what changes are going to be made, but are they going to represent investors' interests, or are they going to be sort of fighting for their own lives and for their own profitability and really looking at things through a lens of what's good for them? And our insight was we needed to have a voice of investors. And that was, I think, a really important thing. So we started the group in 2009, um, the concept being there should be a voice of investors at the table for financial regulatory reform. We're very public in saying we supported reform, and we had some criteria in terms of transparency, being good for investors, and things like that. Those things are still, they're a little bit mom and apple pie, but they're still true today. Little did I know that this was going to turn into a full-time and then some job. I mean, we have a whole team of people today. We had zero, and it's become a global thing. But it's everything from money market funds to ETFs, market structure, products, I mean, you name it, the importance of having an investor voice is huge. Now, the other funny thing is, think about the money we manage. We manage other people's money. We don't manage our own money. We don't have a balance sheet, per se. So let's say you're a large pension plan, and you hire BlackRock to manage your money, and you hire 10 managers. Do you, at the pension level, do you go and lobby? The answer is no. A lot of these pension plans have very few people home. It's not none, and here I am in California, you have pers and stirs and they're very vocal. But the average pension plan in America, there's a handful of people home, and whether it's corporate or it's public, the last thing on their list is that they're gonna get active politically. So they've outsourced the asset management, they just assume you're gonna take care of things for them. So if we don't engage on policy issues, who is going to represent that? And that's actually a big problem in, in the way our system is set up. A handful of times we've gotten clients to, to come and, and attend something, but generally they are not interested. And yet in Washington, people will say to you, if this is so important to your clients, how come we never see them? 
But the model is an outsourced model. That's why you don't see them. They don't have anyone to even do that. So I do think it's important to, to be involved in policy. I think, um, I'll say knock on wood, I think we have been um, effective in a constructive way. Everything we do is extremely transparent. If any of you have insomnia and want to go on our website, we publish lots of materials. We publish viewpoints, which are policy positions. Uh, we submit comment letters. Uh, we do these all over the world. And we put them all out for everyone to see. So there's no backroom deals. There's no you know, funny business. It's a very transparent, very solutions oriented. Try to understand what problem regulators want to solve or, or legislators. And then offer constructive solutions that are good for investors. So let me ask you, uh, I, I want to read another uh, quotation from uh, one of Larry's letters. I think it was either this year or last year. I can't remember. Um, he writes, we have no intention of telling companies what their purpose should be. That is the role of your management team and your board of directors. Rather, we seek to understand how a company's purpose informs its strategy and culture to underpin sustainable financial performance. So let's say I'm a CEO, I have a company, and uh, my core competency is acquiring drugs and increasing prices to maximize profits. Uh, and I determine, and with the board, that this is the best way to maximize not only short-term, but long-term. It may not be the longest term, but long-term value. Uh, so do you just take that as given, or do you push well, back a little bit? Let's take the real example. There's a point where it gets pushed back, right? So you have reputation risk. You have regulatory risk. You can say, that's my strategy. That's, that's my plan. But is that a long-term sustainable plan? I would personally, I would question it, right? Because there will be pushback. And in the world we live in, one of the other things Larry talks about in his letter is, you know, in a world of social media and millennials, you know, companies will be targeted. And they can't just act in, I'll say, irresponsible ways without there being consequences. So I don't think it's a conflict to say, I think that that kind of behavior will be self-correcting over time. And I think if Milton Friedman was here, you know, he's probably like turning over in his grave somewhere, looking at corporate malfeasance. You know, yes, it's nice to say profitability is the most important thing, but how about ethics and just common sense and good business judgment? And I think that's what's gotten lost along the way in some of these failures. So let me ask you, uh, we always talk about uh, in any one of these endeavors, how do you measure the outcome? And so uh, you're uh, set out to change companies in terms of thinking about long-term strategy uh, and do a number of things. Now, I would guess that some are easier to measure than others, board diversity, things of that sort. Uh, but when we talk about these long-term values for both companies and for society, do you have in your mind some way of measuring, say, five years, 10 years, 15 years out, uh, whether you move the needle or not, and how would you do that? Right, so that is a very challenging question. There's no doubt in my mind. But I'll give a few examples um, of how I would think about it. And, and again, it's not the academic study and, and, and rigor, but certainly things that you can observe. Um, so one would be looking at governance and looking at governance over time. When I started my career, the normal corporate board structure was frankly a bunch of guys who were all CEOs, who all sat on each other's boards. That was just the way it was, and that was accepted. That was considered reasonable. Today, you don't see that at all, certainly not in the United States. Today, if you are a sitting CEO, chances are your board says you can sit on no outside boards, or maybe one. You don't see a CEO on a bunch of boards and all on each other's boards. An independent director, 10 years ago, wouldn't be uncommon to find somebody on seven, eight, nine boards. I mean, that was like their income. It was their retirement and, you know, stay involved and have a portfolio of things to do. Today, our board, we limit them to four, including our board. 
And that's not uncommon. And when we're voting and looking at directors, we're looking for directors who are qualified and engaged. And if they're missing meetings, if they're you know, on too many boards, we call it overboarding. I mean, these are, are flags for, are they going to do a good job in the boardroom? I mean, think about your bank. There were so many whistleblowers. There's so many people quitting. How could they not notice? Well, then they're not an engaged board, right? So I, I use that example. Um, the look forward, or, or the most recent is, um, I'll pick on purpose. We think of purpose as you know, sort of a, I'll say, long-term strategy, closely related culture. The three of them are sort of a continuum that if you have a clearly defined purpose, some people call it, it's your North Star. Where do I want to be long-term? How do I have a long-term strategy that matches that? How do I get employees excited about that and really sort of bring things together? Put whatever word you want on it. In the last couple of years, if you look at annual reports, and we did some sort of AI stuff on, on some annual reports, you'll see an increasing number of CEOs have started talking about their company differently. And they are, if you look, I forget if it was two letters back or three letters back, but one of Larry's letters, he said, I want you to lay out your long-term strategy. I want to know that the board has approved that strategy. And you're starting to see boards get much more engaged in that way. You're starting to see in the CEO letters, in the investor day presentations, that is shifting in that direction. That has nothing to do with us voting. That has to do with us sending a letter, right? And you know, definitely reinforcing it, but it makes people think differently. Um, the long term, the only test I can think of, which is not a very easy to quantify, but it's an obs observation test, is how many spectacular corporate failures do we have? How many incredibly bad lapses in judgment? If we go for a long period without that, it means we've been wildly successful. I'm going to just ask one more question, then we'll open it up to, uh, to questions from the audience. And uh, I'll again, read from uh, one of Larry's letters. And again, I apologize for not remembering which one it is. But um, he writes, your company strategy must articulate a path to achieve financial performance. To sustain that performance, however, you must understand the societal impact of your business, as well as the ways that broad structural trends, from slow wage growth to rising automation to climate change, affect your potential growth. As I read that, I was thinking there's a collective action or a free rider problem. So I'm a CEO. I would love to see all the other CEOs in this room increase wages so that people can buy my product. I would love to see everyone take uh, actions to reduce CO2 emissions and me not have to do it. And so it occurs to me that you're in a position as BlackRock potentially to put some pressure on to solve a collective action problem where everyone would like to see someone else do something. Um, do you think about it in that way or do you think about just engaging each company and trying to convince that company that it's in their interest, even though there is this underlying collective action problem. Right, so first thing is, um, and I think in one of the quotes you said, we don't tell companies what to do, right? We ask a lot of probing questions, and we're trying to understand and be informed voters, right? And we may give some pushback, and we may say, you know, that doesn't sound right to us. You know, do you do an employee opinion survey? Right? What does it say? You know, we do an employee opinion survey, and I'm excited to say 91% of our employees last year said they're proud to work at BlackRock. That's a really good thing. Right? And there is some research from academia that you know, companies with more um, positive, I'll say, HCM policies versus more negative have better results. And companies with problematic policies have actually some bad results. So you're starting to see that research. You're starting to be able to quantify some of these things. And you know, it's a little bit of an art. It's not the most perfect science. But we do encourage people. You know, diversity is a big one. You know, do you really think that a group that 
all went to the same schools, looks the same, talks the same, has the same background. Do you really think that they're going to challenge each other? Or are you going to get a lot of group think, going to both miss the new opportunity trend and probably miss the car coming around the corner that's going to run you over in the street? So you know, I think it's a combination of things that we can encourage certain things. But keep in mind, even with all that money you mentioned at the beginning, we're a minority shareholder generally single digits. So even if BlackRock says X, that CEO has a fiduciary responsibility to all shareholders. And if 90% of the shareholders say Y and we say X, OK, we have an interesting idea and it's not really very relevant. So it's only if a lot of their shareholders have similar comments and similar views that they would then integrate that. Or if they say, well, that's a really good idea. That's something that we haven't been thinking about. Your question makes me. Looking at the CEOs and the fact that in their annual reports, in their, their, their investor day presentations, they're now talking more about purpose. They're talking more about long-term plans. I think they've adopted that as, actually, that's a good idea. I think many of the companies will tell you they want long-term shareholders. They want patient capital. They don't want all these people who are flipping their stock. So if that's something that helps them with the long-term shareholders, they consider that a positive for their business. Good. So uh, I think we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Sure. And I have a question that <clears throat> relates to governance, which occurs to me a lot. I, I, first of all, I, I, I applaud what BlackRock is doing. But it has occurred to me, in the governance sense, how do you reassure yourself, Barbara, that what you're doing, because mostly BlackRock is a fiduciary. It's managing not its own money, you made that point, but other people's money. Do you do a systematic polling, polling probably is not practical, but a systematic outreach to the people you represent as investors to make sure that your taste is in sync with theirs? OK. It's a very interesting question. It would actually be impossible to do that. OK. Why? Because we have millions of investors in our funds. Well, I guess we could do some sort of sampling. But I would say what we do is we're very transparent. We put our voting record on the website. There's lots of ways of saying, do I like this provider or that provider or that provider? There's plenty of competition in our industry. And uh, actually, Commissioner Jackson has talked about wanting more transparency, that buyers should be uh, um, certainly informed and, and aware. And he's looked at, we just revitalized our website, reissued it in, in January or relaunched it in January. And he, he said he thinks it's a model of what people should be doing. So we put our voting guidelines. We put our engagement priorities. We put a quarterly and annual report um, with engagement examples. Um, we put our voting record. We put all of our viewpoints and comment letters. Like everything we're doing is extremely easy to see, positions we're taking. And anybody who wants to be informed can be. They can choose us. They can choose a different provider. We're not the only ones with a website. Um, so I'd say that is the direction of travel. In terms of being a fiduciary, there's a very interesting sub-question there. So take the example of we manage thousands of portfolios. Um, and even within the fund family, we have hundreds of funds. So let's say there's a merger. Let's say your, your friend is buying a drug company. We could be on both sides. Are we on both sides the same in every portfolio? Probably not. So our voting is actually portfolio specific. So we have through our, our Aladdin system, when we're voting, we can see not just how many shares we have, but what portfolios they're in. And if it's a merger type situation, we will do an assessment portfolio by portfolio what is in the best interest as a fiduciary to that fund? And that's actually very important. And sometimes we end up with split votes. Uh, Jim. Uh, 
you said you engage with companies, and I understand the problem with uh, index funds. But of the S and P 500 stocks, how many have you engaged with in the last, say, three years? A person meeting with an executive or others. Right. Um, you know, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. We put in our annual report, we actually have a table where we talk about the number of engagements and the number of companies. And I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't know the number right off. But it's a, it's a large number. Um, the team is worldwide 40 people. Uh, we do try and prioritize. You know, there are some companies we say, well, we don't really see any issues. So, you know, there's not, not a lot of reason. Um, we do a lot of um, events in addition to individual engagements. So we'll go and we'll speak at events. We'll talk about the things that we consider priorities. Uh, we'll do a lot of bilateral meetings at those events. So it's a combination of different ways of engaging. But it's, it's a pretty high percentage. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the last event that Cassie had, Cohorts Inside Initiative, was about corporate accountability. Uh, and we had a short seller, a judge, and a reporter. So they were, uh, so you're the long investor. We had a short investor who was interested in fraud specifically, and uh, it was for about Tesla and Wells Fargo and, and the judicial system, the justice system when it comes to corporate um, and individual uh, white collar uh, crime in particular. And the sense from there was that, that it's not, that great a situation. We're better than uh, Brazil, we heard at the end. Uh, so we should take comfort of that uh, in terms of corruption. But um, so we do have a system, but there was a sense that executives are not held accountable for things. Uh, I had a chance to read the independent director's report of Wells Fargo uh, for a testimony I gave. And um, it did seem like, um, you know, not necessarily going to jail, but even financially, uh, there is not enough uh, individual accountability for investors, even in the settlements. And Judge Rakoff was complaining uh, about uh, the justice system. Uh, what position does BlackRock have on, on, a, on that issue of accountability? So I would say we would rather see more personal accountability than these huge corporate fines. Because if you think about these huge corporate fines, it's coming from the shareholders, right? So you're punishing the people who really didn't have anything to do with it and didn't really have a lot of control to change it. And then you're giving you know, some huge check to somewhere, and that's coming out of shareholders. I would much rather see, and, and this is a legislative and regulatory thing, this is nothing that you know, BlackRock as an investor has any control over, but I would much rather see um, you know, settlements per se or, or accountability that is tied more to the person. And you know, in some regimes around the world, that's the direction it's going. It seems like <clears throat> there's a, a radical interpretation of what Larry Fink has been writing about and what BlackRock is doing that it's changing the idea of what the purpose of a corporation is, that it should be serving society rather than maximizing profit. There's also a very mild version of it, which is the purpose has not changed. It's still to maximize profit, but that BlackRock and Larry Fink is now kind of has a different idea about how to do that in the long term. It's more around sustainability. So do you think that the, the purpose of the corporation, the, the objective function the corporation is trying to solve has not changed? It's still to maximize profit? Um, pretty much. I mean, what we say in the letter this year is purpose and profit is inextricably linked. So if you go down the path of it's all about purpose and nothing about profit, you won't be in business, right? There won't be anything to, to argue about. You have to look at these two as somewhat symbiotic. And I go back to the business examples. If you treat your employees well, probably have lower turnover, lower cost of acquiring employees, lower cost of training employees, same thing with clients. Treat your clients well. They'll be your clients. They'll come back. They'll shop in your store. Whatever the, the you know, product or service that you're offering, having long-term clients and loyal clients is an extremely valuable thing. You know, if you burn your reputation, it can't possibly be good for your brand. So there's lots of different ways of looking at it, but I don't think fundamentally that these um, you know, sustainability issues are all that different than saying good business judgment and how do you stay in business for a long term? Hey, Ron. Um, 
My name is Tiffany and I'm a Sloan Fellow. My question is somewhat similar but a different angle. I guess I'm wondering is, is this in some ways a reaction to government perhaps not providing enough corporate oversight or is it because we as the American populace is not civically engaged enough? I'm wondering if corporations are now compensating for perhaps two other <coughs> groups that should be holding corporations accountable. Yeah, you know, I think there's been an evolution. Um, certainly, 20 years ago, asset managers were not very engaged in stewardship. Not zero, but not as much as they are today. Um, for us as a company, the big change was when we did the acquisition of, of BGI, this is where all the passive assets started from. And all of a sudden, we went from being a relatively small equity manager with only active portfolios to a much larger equity manager with a significant amount of passive. And we started thinking about it differently, but even then it took us a couple of years to sort of really get our heads around, well, if we are a long-term patient capital investor, then we need to protect the downside and help in maximizing the upside. So investment storage for us is an investment function at BlackRock. It's not a thing over on the side. It's actually part of the investment team. Uh, <coughs> so in addition to your role at BlackRock, uh, you also are on the board of Council of CFA Institute, right? And uh, I have a question. So a few days ago, those of us who are CFA charter holders or CFA candidates received a very concerning email from the president of CFA Institute that uh, the institute was investigated by Department of Justice and had to pay like $300,000 of fines because they were uh, blamed that uh, they discriminated against U.S. employees by hiring some temporary workers uh, to grade exams. And this is an example of this, like, I guess, buy American, hire American <coughs> policy. And w what's your view on that and w what effect it has on like corporations and society? Your point of view. So I'm actually not on the CFA board. Um, at one point they did ask me to be and I said, well, I'm not a CFA charter holder. I don't think I should be on your board. I don't think that would be, <laughs> it, seemed, it, it seemed wrong for the, for the organization. I am on a committee that they have, which is about the future of finance. Um, and this came out of the crisis and some of the accountability and morality and ethics and you know, things like that, but uh, I'm not a board member. View on the, the <laughs> trend. I think I'll pass on that. <laughs> we'll go to the next one. I guess, uh, so in a lot of this discussion, you've talked about how BlackRock can be a force for good governance. And I guess one question I have is how do we govern BlackRock as a society to make sure that the way you're doing governance is something that we want? And one particular example stands out is there's been a lot of this research on this common ownership problem. That if corporations respond to the interests of shareholders, shareholders are highly diversified, then there's really not that much incentive for corporations to compete. This can just be as innocuous as you go there every day and you say, we want you to focus on long-term research and development, and the CEOs have no time to then do competitive strategy and try to fight a price war. And so I'm not trying to say the state of exactly what's going on, but if, how does, do we as society, right, engage with a giant corporation like BlackRock, who a lot of us can't afford to not do business with, and then what happens when we see things that the governance of the way that BlackRock is operating isn't fulfilling this, like, broader societal objective? Okay, so you asked an excellent question, um, and I'm going to encourage, again, lots of things on our website. In fact, we have a whole section on common ownership. Um, but let me step back. Let me talk first about concentration and then about the common ownership theory and, and some of the flaws. Um, on concentration, we're actually doing some work right now to look at, you know, BlackRock, take global equities, we manage about 4.5%. It turns out Vanguard's about the same. They're a smidgen ahead. State Street, a little bit less. So if you add up the top three managers, you get to 11 11 is not 50, 11, okay? So a lot of the articles that get written, and I found this throughout the financial crisis aftermath, a lot of people forget that asset managers manage about 
let's say, 25 to 30 percent of the investable assets. A huge percentage is managed by sovereign wealth funds, pension plans, endowments, individuals for themselves. So sometimes I call it the denominator problem. Sometimes people will talk about how much index funds there are. And if you read the numbers carefully, they'll say, you know, index funds are taking over and it's 40% or 45%, if you read carefully, it says, of mutual funds. But mutual funds are only 20% of the investable universe. So you have to know what the denominator is that, that you're looking at. So this first thing is the concentration is much less than certainly the popular press articles and some academic articles from other institutions uh, might suggest. <laughs> I'm sure that kind of work wouldn't come out of here or not. Um, but that's the first part. The second part is the common ownership theory. Um, and we, we put out two things recently. Uh, one is we submitted a comment letter to the FTC and we hired a group called Analysis Group to actually test the model of the people who were claiming there was this common ownership. So this all started with a, a paper. Um, it was posted on SSRN. It's subsequently been published. In the time between SSRN and publication, they wouldn't release their model. So nobody could really test it, replicate it, be 100% sure. Um, but in August, they did publish. They did put their, their data and their model out there. So now that it's been tested, it turns out the model's not robust at all. And analysis group did the work. Um, it's in our FTC letter. I encourage you to look at it. And if you change either of the variables just a little on control or on financial incentive, which are the two variables that make up the, the crux of the model, the results completely go away. So in our letter, we also outline a whole bunch of other issues. But even more fundamentally, and I, I just gave Paul before this a, a two-pager, there's something we have. It's called a policy spotlight. And it says policy spotlight incorrect data. It turns out they didn't understand index construction. When a company goes bankrupt, it is delisted from the exchange. When it's delisted from the exchange, it's actually removed from the index. As an index manager, when it's not in the index, we sell it from the portfolio. So they say in their paper, and it's just one little sentence, you know, we didn't observe, there were no observed values during periods of bankruptcy. So what did we do? We overrode the zeros by taking the last observed value and rolling it forward. And you might say, all right, well, that doesn't matter. It's just a few data points. Oh, no. This is a study on airlines in a period where five of the seven airlines in the study went through bankruptcy. US Air went through bankruptcy twice. It was taken out of the index. It was not put back in until it came out of bankruptcy a second time four and a half years later. So you look at the, the, this two-page paper, and you realize you've taken zeros, and you've put in four, five, six percent for periods of either several months or several years for five out of seven airlines. Now, how can that be a good quality paper? That is the foundational paper of the entire common ownership theory. So again, we have a resource center on our website about common ownership. You can see all the challenge papers. You can see lots of things. But people have challenged the data, the model, the methodology, the theory, and forget the, the proposed remedies are, are completely insane. Um, but you know, it's out there. I guess this is the bottom question now. Uh, if we think BlackRock has power to influence governance, it must be because you have some kind of market power, right? That they are forced to deal with you. That's how you have power. How do we, but then how do we as society govern the way that BlackRock chooses to govern, right? That well, we're a highly regulated company, right? So we're registered with the SEC. Um, each of our mutual funds, we have three major mutual fund families in the US, uh, plus we have a bank trust company. Each of those entities has a board of directors, many more independent directors than inside directors. Um, my team goes and actually presents to those boards. They look at our voting policies. They see what our engagement priorities are. I mean, we, we give a formal presentation to them every year. If we were doing something that somebody thought was not reasonable, 
I'm sure they'd bring it up. And I'll give an example. You know, last year we said, I think we had a somewhat bright line on diversity. And we said, you know, if you don't have two women, we're pretty likely to, to vote against you on the board. Um, and I don't remember exactly how we phrased it, but certainly that's how it came across. And you know, we got a lot of feedback. Well, what about African Americans? And what about Latinos? And what about Asians? And what about all these other categories? Are you going to create you know, a quota system and fill in a, you know, each of these buckets? And I thought about it, and I said, well, you know, what, the way we wrote it, it's not really what we meant. What we really meant is we're looking for diversity of thought and if someone came in and, and we said, well, you know, we're going to use this as a flag because it's visible, easy to measure, easy to look, it tells us, is this a company we want to look at more? If we then got there and they said, well, here's our five African Americans and we have no women, OK. You know, I, I think we have to look at this more broadly. But is it a good flag? It's a good flag. So if you, if you took the language of last year and this year and you held them side by side, you'd see we changed the language a little. And that was based on feedback. So you know, these things are living documents, and, and they evolve. Um, but we're highly regulated and highly supervised. And people can also vote with their feet. As I said, you know, the concentration issue, there's a lot of competitors who would be very happy to have your money. About um, a larger role of the government through higher corporate taxes, more regulations. And do you think that will be more effective than relying on business leaders? Because for example, you meant about uh, you talked about more transparency um, nowadays with social media. I think for partly that's true, but still, when I uh, get my guess at, and I have to decide be between Shell or Chevron, I have no idea who has a better pension plan for their employees. Those kind of things. And secondly, I also the the porridge problem that you mentioned. I have the feeling that it's to, that for companies, it's also a trade of doing just enough. It's also um, doing just enough is not only only about uh, like what, what has the highest societal benefits, but also what provides you as a comp company most publicity, etc. So, is, isn't the government shouldn't the government get a higher role in, in dealing with the and shouldn't companies be paying higher corporate taxes? Is, is that not more effective? Well, those are a lot of different questions. <laughs> I'm not sure we have enough time to do all of them. Um, I personally don't think every problem should be solved by the government. Um, I think that there are private sector solutions to a lot of things. Um, you know, one of the hot issues right now has to do with data, what data are companies providing or not providing. Um, SEC Chair Clayton says, you know, companies should disclose material information that a reasonable investor would need to make a decision. We agree with that. Um, we're working with a group called SASB. We think it's very industry specific. We don't think it's a one size fits all. Is that a good thing for a government to get involved? You know, you'd have some government task force, they'd come up with something, and then it's stuck. How does it evolve? How does it change? You know, I'm not sure that that's a great spot for government to get involved, and yet that's being debated right now in Washington. I would rather see a private sector solution where enough investors think this is important that companies voluntarily disclose things that some do today and some don't. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a timely question and it's an evolving area, um, but I would probably lean a little bit more towards private sector. So I'd like to thank Barbara for uh, making the trip out here. And, uh...